A very good afternoon to you all and uh, happy World Green Building Week, everyone. This is, uh, this is day one of a packed week of events around the world, which is both a celebration and a call to action to deliver a sustainable built environment for everyone everywhere. My name is Stephen Richardson and I am the director of World Green Building Council's Europe Regional Network and I will be your master of ceremonies for this Build Upon Squared European Leaders Summit this afternoon. And I'm delighted to be joined here on the stage by uh, someone who I think it's fair to say is the mastermind of the Build Upon Squared project, our project coordinator Raquel Diez from uh, the Green Building Council España, GBC España. And it's our pleasure together to welcome you all to this summit where we're going to be tackling what I believe is Europe's most critical climate challenge. How do we renovate and decarbonize tens of millions of existing buildings in just a few short decades? And that challenge is, is the raison d'etre for the Build Upon Square project which brings together eight of our European Green Building Councils and our partners, Climate Alliance and Buildings Performance Institute Europe, BPIE, and is funded by uh, the European Commission's Horizon 2020 programme. Uh, Raquel, over to you for a few words of welcome. Thanks Matt, Stephen. Good afternoon, everybody, and be welcome to this uh, great event prepared by a uh, World Green Building Council. Thanks, by the way. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. And in fact, celebrate with us the completion of the Build Upon Square project. It has been uh, two years and a half of an intense and enlightening teamwork that allowed us to present today the results of, of this process with our renovation impact framework as core element. A collaborative process that has involved around 300 stakeholders from eight different European countries, to whom I would like to express my sincere gratitude the pilot cities, the follower cities, the members of the eight national steering groups, the advisory board, every piece of input provided by you has been really very valuable for our work. A big thank you also to our project advisor, Michele Sansoni, for his continued support, understanding and flexibility along the project, which has allowed us in fact to achieve better results. Results that I can certainly say are beyond the expectations and that show somehow the deep engagement and commitment of all the project partners during this time. I would like to acknowledge here the excellent work carried out by all, the, by all of them. Uh, to start with uh, the GBCs from Ireland, Italy, Hungary, UK, Croatia, Poland, Turkey and Spain. In fact, thanks to all, of, uh, to all my colleagues especially Emilio, Alicia and Lucia. And then also with uh, uh, as partner, central partner also supporting the coordination and the communication work in Building Council. And of course, BPIE and Climate Alliance whose uh, work has, has been also key in the development of this project. In the distance, we've walked together a long path, certainly intense, but above all, I can say that I'm reaching and that has led us to grow and learn from each other. I'm sure of that. Two years and a half ago, we began to walk this path together in Madrid, and we couldn't even imagine that today's event would not be held in person due to a pandemic. The adaptation to this situation has required to reshape the path with new turns and diversions. But this path, I can say that is far from being blocked. It continues. And this summit is just a stop to come together and a bridge to what's ahead for us. So I encourage you to enjoy this stop in the pathway, celebrate with us and let's share through the sessions prepared. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Raquel. And uh, before we dive into the, uh, the, the agenda that we have for you this afternoon, uh, of course, uh, a few housekeeping points uh, about the platform. Um, so just to orientate you, and I, I would encourage you, even if you are a frequent user of virtual conference platforms, please pay attention because the features of this platform may differ from platforms that you've used in the past. Um, so you'll notice that your screen is, is sort of has three, broadly three areas. On the left, there's the navigation pane where you can find your way around to different parts of the conference. 
Um, then in the center, you have the content. So depending on where you are, you'll see the content uh, for that, that particular part of the event in the center of your panel. And on the right, there's uh, the, the communications and engagement section. So there's a number of tabs there. Um, there's a chat tab, so you can uh, you can chat to uh, different people in the different event, in the different parts of the event. So make sure you're in the right mode, either event, stage, uh, or the session mode if you're in one of the breakout sessions uh, so that you're communicating to the right group. Um, and you can also send private chat to individuals by clicking on their names. There's a people tab so you can see who is in the session that you're in, uh, whether you're on the, on the main stage or in, or in a breakout. And you can search by name or title and even, as I've mentioned, send private messages to people uh, via that tab. There's a poll tab, so uh, keep your eyes and ears peeled for announcements from the speakers. We'll be using that function a few times throughout the afternoon. Uh, we want to keep this a, a nice and interactive session. So when you're instructed to, please go to the poll tab and respond um, with, with your answers to the questions posed there. There's also the Q&A tab, which is where you can pose questions yourself to our speakers. Um, so for the presentations in, on the stage um, or in the breakout sessions, you can use that Q&A tab to type your questions. And you can either ask questions anonymously or we'd encourage you, if you're, if you're happy to, to share your name uh, so we know who's asking the question. And then there's also a, a, a function where there's a red dot will appear if you have new messages, new notifications, new chat. So the red dot will appear on, on the right uh, in the respective tab. Hopefully that's fairly straightforward, but if you do get lost or stuck at any point, then you can always head over to the help desk in the sessions area and there should be somebody there who can help you find you your way back to where you need to be. So right now you don't need to go anywhere. You're in the right place because we'll shortly be kicking off our opening plenary on this main stage. But before we do that, I've promised you some interactivity. So it's on you now. Uh, and we'd like to open our first poll. Um, uh, we're, we want to know uh, who is in the room. So uh, we've got leaders from all across Europe. I know there are people from reg registered from uh, Finland, uh, Italy, Poland, Spain, the UK, Germany, Netherlands, uh, all, all across the region. But we'd like to know who you represent. So which part of the value chain? So hopefully the poll is open and you can give us your results, uh, your responses there. Fantastic. I'm seeing some uh, nice diverse stakeholders, which is great. And uh, I can see we've got we have got people from both the public and the private side, which is uh, is very encouraging because that is the theme of our first plenary, which we'll now move into. So, um, uh, just as the poll wraps up, uh, I'll just introduce this session. So the. The first plenary is called Building Private and Public Momentum Behind the EU's Renovation Wave. And I'm sure I don't need to say much about, about the renovation wave. Many of you will know the details, but broadly, it's, a, it's a, a, a really ambitious initiative from the European Commission to um, its headline ambition is to renovate 35 million buildings by the end of this decade. Incredibly ambitious program, and we've got some fantastic speakers for you this afternoon to explore this and look at the role that different stakeholders can take in supporting that initiative. So uh, I'll introduce you to our, our panel. Uh, we are joined by Christina Gamboa, who's the CEO of the World Green Building Council. Christina is a veteran of the Green Building Council movement. She's worked uh, as the CEO of Columbia Green Building Council before coming to London in 2018 to be the CEO of World GBC. And she has over 25 years of professional experience spanning sustainability, economic research, journalism, international affairs, you name it, Christina has probably done it. So welcome, Christina. Uh, we also have, uh, there's a little bit of echo on the line. I don't know if somebody in the in the back can, uh, can try and stop that. But we also have Stefan Moser, who is head of unit for energy efficiency at the Commission's Directorate General for Energy. Uh, try and fit that on a business card. Um, Stefan trained, in fact, as an economist and a lawyer uh, and has been with the Commission since uh, since 2000. 
but he's worked on sustainability and environmental topics in several DGs since 2005 and became head of unit at ENA in 2015. And I've had the pleasure of hearing Stefan speak uh, several times uh, uh, on the topic of buildings and I've always been impressed at the breadth and depth of his knowledge on the matter. So I'm very pleased that you're joining us this afternoon again, Stefan, it's great to welcome you. Next, we have uh, David Dukan, who is the COO, the Chief Operating Officer of Knauf Insulation. David has a background in building physics and has been with Knauf since 1997. He's worked in, in their process and product development departments, and he became COO in 2016. Uh, and we are very fortunate at World GBC to have the support and expertise of him and his team as one of our European regional partners. So welcome to our panel this afternoon, David. And finally, uh, uh, we have uh, Liz McKeon, who is head of the Climate Action Portfolio at the IKEA Foundation. And Liz has worked in global development for several decades and joined IKEA Foundation in 2014. She's played a key role in its growth to become one of the largest private philanthropies in Europe and today leads uh, the climate action work of the foundation, which aims to enact that systemic shift that's necessary to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. So I'm going to ask our uh, four speakers to start each by sharing uh, a few opening remarks um, before we then move into the panel discussion. And that's where you'll be able to put your questions to them. And you can do this, as I said before, uh, in the question box, the Q&A box in Hopin. So type your questions in there. They'll be passed through to me and I will uh, put them to our panel. And they and I will do our best to get through as many as we can. I can't promise we will answer all of them. Uh, but without further ado, I would like to invite Christina, uh, Christina Gambo from the World GBC to give us your opening remarks and set the scene a little bit in terms of what's at stake here and how the Build Upon Squared project uh, aims to support the aims of the EU Innovation Wave. Christina, over to you. Thank you, Stephen. Hello, David, Stephen, Liz, everyone. I'm very happy to be joining this Build Upon Virtual Summit. It is today the flagship event of our as we head into the first day of World Green Building Week 2021. So this year's theme for World Green Building Week is building resilience for climate, economies and communities. And I guess <laughs> what a better way to kick off this conversation than with this very simple notion of out with the new and in with the old. What better way to tackle building resilience than by making the building stock which already exists more sustainable. I am here today also to reach out to the thousands out there hearing to us because we are in a state of emergency and time is running out. And uh, as we go into COP26 and we are campaigning as for buildings as a critical climate solution, uh, we know that we can be a big part of this journey to unlocking uh, what's, what's needed and that we're up to the challenge. Figures, we've, we've been saying the figures for some years, you know, the building stock because of its characteristics of unsustainability and uh, un, they're not fit for purpose are almost 40% responsible for 40% of energy related carbon emissions worldwide. Meaning, meaning that it is possibly the biggest contributing sector to climate change. So there won't be a Paris Agreement without the built environment. And also, we know that many regions of the world are still urbanizing at a very high rate, meaning that new buildings will be happening. And we have to go back to the mantra of energy efficiency first, because best, the best quality infrastructure is the one that has good solutions in energy efficiency. And of course, we now have also to address that they are low in embodied carbon. In Europe, the building renovation wave uh, has, has to pick up. The building renovation rates have been stuck at 1.2% for some years, and that's not that's not the scale we need. And uh, luckily, of course, the EU is stepping up uh, to this mark and taking on the challenge. And as we've heard, 2019, we set up uh, and our HEBC set up this collaboration project, Build Upon Two, that is bringing together European cities, local authorities to implement best practice renovation. So as we, as a collective, are working together to unlock the renovation impact frameworks we're, we're being rolling out, 
that is a tool for developing a methodology and metrics to measure the holistic benefits of renovations. I want to invite you that we radically uh, collaborate and renovate our building stock at the pace and scale that is needed. I am very excited to hear the solutions, how we can continue to drive this conversation forward. And again, welcome to the summit and in particular to World Green Building Week. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you, Christina. Uh, so next, uh, with your opening remarks, I'd like to invite uh, Stefan Moser from the Commission. Um, perhaps you can uh, share a, a few of the initiatives that are going on at the Commission level that will support the aims of the renovation wave. Over to you, Stefan. Thank you very much, um, uh, Stephen. Good afternoon um, to all of you. Christina, also thank you very much for, for the um, um, opening of the panel. Um, we are very grateful for uh, having such a um, in-depth policy dialogue with you um, at the World Green, uh, World Green Building Council. Uh, this is a major um, uh, contributor initiative um, and promoter of, of building renovations and all the work which you're doing under your umbrella, but also with your cooperating partners. Um, as you said, um, Christina, uh, we now need to move forward very quickly. It's an essential part of, of uh, the international climate agenda um, uh, in the run-up to COP26. We need to um, break down basically uh, into concrete actions um, uh, the efforts needed. Um, uh, we are uh, working intensively in inside the EU, but also with our international partners. And we are aware, of course, of uh, very important international efforts elsewhere um, from which we draw inspiration. Um, how we move forward, how we can um, green buildings, uh, how we can reduce the amount of energy um, being um, uh, spent for buildings, uh, being used for buildings, but also the greenhouse gas emissions. And we are trying to really develop the regulatory agenda, but also the funding um, tools and, and information tools available. Um, for that, we look at, at good practices across the world, uh, but uh, also at, at uh, in-depth analysis uh, provided by, by your um, organization and, and others, and uh, are aiming to, to come forward with a legislative proposal to improve the Energy Performance in Buildings Directive um, in the next few months. Um, in order to introduce uh, also further standards, minimum energy performance standards for, for buildings. Um, we will need to find the right calibration between the EU level and the member states. Member states will be very crucial in developing the strategies, uh, the in-depth assessment um, at the local and regional level, and uh, try also to, and that's extremely important, to, to uh, integrate uh, citizens in their um, wishes and ambitions to develop a, a broad agenda addressing uh, and creating a number of synergies across climate energy, renewable integration, uh, in particular uh, link with transport, but also then safety, um, um, accessibility, uh, health, uh, better health in buildings and simply better living quality and extremely important social policy uh, inclusion uh, of people who are most vulnerable, uh, addressing the worst performing buildings uh, first and foremost. We will also try to uh, to de define what are deep renovations, how to carry out deep renovations. Really, we need to accelerate more than double the renovation rates, but also deepen renovations. And that will only be possible um, through a mutual and shared understanding across the entire stakeholder community what that is in order to direct also funding, including from the private sector. And we need to bring together the good practices, share good practice across the borders. And uh, that will be a key to success, uh, to really uh, learn from each other and be open um, and, and see, of course, uh, what can most full, usefully be applied at the, uh, in the specific circumstances in each uh, community. Uh, it's it's community-driven, it's citizens-driven, and that's extremely important. So with that, um, we I'm very excited to be here today, and uh, I'm I'm very interested and and uh, and eager to to learn more uh, from what different speakers, but also the panel, uh, the the participants, uh, will want to say. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you, Stefan. Great to have you with us. So we've heard there from the uh, the the public side, if you like, from the Commission side. Um, 
we're, we'll move now to the private sector and uh, David David Dukan from Knopf Insulation. Could you give us your your thoughts on on what role the private sector is playing in in supporting the the goals of the renovation wave? For sure. Um, thank you, Stephen. Good uh, afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and to be able to contribute to this debate. So Knopf Insulation is indeed a private player in the building sustainability sector. We are building envelope specialists and our solutions contribute to reducing uh, carbon emissions from building, uh, reducing energy use, uh, but also improving fire safety or uh, resilience uh, versus uh, extreme climate event like our green, wool, uh, green roof solutions. So building sustainability is at the heart of what we do. And in Europe today, we have about 60% of our uh, products that are going into renovation already today. It's a trend that has been increasing over the years. Um, when I started in this uh, business uh, 20 years ago, it was maybe a third, but today it is more than half that is going into renovation. Of course, new builds have improved as well, and this is uh, going now to near zero uh, uh, energy. Uh, but renovation remains a problem or a more difficult uh, market to tackle. And indeed, there is a, a, a crucial question. Uh, when you look on paper what it means to renovate buildings, it's good for creating jobs. It is existing technologies. We don't need to invest tens of billions into developing a, a new hydrogen uh, technology. It pays back. So in the end, it is a CO2 emission avoidance cost, which is negative, which is better than in most sectors. Uh, but still, we are stuck at 0.3% of deep renovation, 1% uh, uh, when we take also medium and light renovation into account. Um, that's a question that we've been asking ourselves for many years now. What can we do to help this market uh, deliver its potential, unlock the renovation wave? And there are two main points uh, that I'd like to share with you today uh, that we believe are key to uh, uh, help this market develop. The first one is, uh, the market uh, today, on average, does not have a level of quality which is high enough. Of course, we have fantastic pilot projects that deliver the expectations, but on average, and especially uh, in the lower uh, uh, renovation um, uh, ambitions, uh, we see projects that do not always deliver the performance that is expected. This market is not very well served because there are not enough players that can deliver a holistic approach to building renovation. It's not high tech, I've said it, but still it requires to take an integrated approach uh, to marry the benefits of a heat pump uh, with new windows uh, and a better roof insulation uh, and, and maybe better doors. All that has to work together. And we see too many times actors that are playing uh, only one aspect uh, of the renovation. So players that can deliver an integrated approach are missing today. There are some and it's growing, but we need to accelerate that trend to be able to serve this market better and make the renovation journey for a gnome owner a bit simpler than it is today, because it's true that they are a bit abandoned and uh, uh, on their own when it comes to make certain technical choices. Um, the other thing, and it's feeding the first point, is that we believe uh, that we should verify the real performance that is delivered by renovations. Uh, very often today, you get subsidies for a measure that is implemented, going from single pane to double pane glazing, for example. You get a euro per uh, square meter, uh, but nobody verifies that the energy savings are really there. With the development of uh, Internet of Things and uh, uh, the lower cost of all these sensors that we can install in houses, we can now measure what is the true energy efficiency uh, that is delivered through uh, energy efficiency renovation. Um, and we believe that's key to unlock uh, the potential to raise the quality and to pay for performance delivered, actually delivered, not to pay for measures. Uh, that's for us a very critical point. Uh, and to accompany that, we need the right regulatory framework. We need energy performance certificates that also take into account real performance approach. We need um, efficiency purchase agreements, a framework that would allow uh, investors to buy energy saved, uh, like they buy today, maybe energy produced by solar panels or an, off an offshore wind farm. 
Um, we, we've noticed that these two elements were critical uh, a, a while back, and uh, uh, we, we started to invest in that sector uh, in the last five years, um, creating a, a, a startup that is looking at developing those methodologies uh, to look at how we can monitor houses to make the best decision with an integrated approach to what a renovation will have either the best payback or the best environmental impact, depending on what the investor wants. And what's very important is that we now have the tools to verify that the energy efficiency is truly delivered and we can give guarantee that this energy efficiency uh, is delivered and therefore the energy savings are really there and are paying uh, this project. So that's the two elements that we see as critical uh, to, to deliver a, an efficient uh, renovation wave in the residential sector uh, in Europe. Uh, and uh, I'll be happy to discuss that further during the debate. Thank you. Thank you, that's wonderful. And I should probably apologize for my terrible um, anglification of your, your name, um, David. Uh, I hope you'll forgive me for that. <laughs> so, um, Finally, uh, I'd like to invite Liz uh, to uh, to give your opening remarks. We've heard here from uh, from the public and the private side now. What about philanthropy? What role can can private philanthropies play that could support uh, you know wh where where others perhaps can't? Well, thank you so much, Stephen, um, and thank you to all the panelists. I'm already inspired writing notes based on what you're saying. And there is quite a lot to say in a short amount of time, but I am excited to share with you the ways in which our foundation, at least, is trying to build upon. At IKEA Foundation, one of our key priorities is to ensure the transition to a cleaner, greener, sustainable planet. And we believe that that transition is possible if all people are given the opportunity to participate in it and to benefit from it. Uh, buildings, as we all know, are one of our most basic needs for the many people. It's where we live and work. It's where we gather and make memories. And buildings are fundamental to our culture and our life. But existing buildings are also, as we know, one of the biggest sources of greenhouse gas emissions. In that, for a philanthropist, you see both an enormous challenge and also an enormous opportunity. And as the Philanthropic Foundation closely related to one of the biggest home furnishing companies in the world, we approach grant making by considering how we can add value to tackle the challenge and to motivate people about the opportunity. So for us, it's not about inventing a solution on our own, but instead supporting what we term unprecedented collaboration to secure the best possible outcomes and adopting a long-term perspective to reach those goals. So let me give you a flavor of some of the work that we fund in Europe, where we apply four strategic lenses, governance, real economy, finance, and people. Getting the governance right with and for the people is a very high priority for us. So we partner, for example, with the European Climate Foundation, ECF, to push for the most ambitious regulations on building renovation in Europe. And here we focus on building elements with the highest greenhouse gas abatement potential. So the building envelope, as was mentioned before, insulation, heating fuel switch, think about gas phase out, or materials used for renovations, embedded emissions. And our goal is to make the renovation wave as ambitious as possible. An important short-term challenge and an opportunity that we see is to advocate for more ambition as the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, the EPBD, is being revised, and in particular to include minimum energy performance requirements for existing buildings. So along with the European Climate Foundation, we also work on just transition and energy poverty in buildings. And there are key opportunities in this regard as well, particularly around the governance of the Social Climate Fund, which we're concerned may not meet its mark for buildings if or if buildings are included in the European emission trading system and the revision of the EPBD. Now to ensure that legislators in the EU are listening to and recognize the challenges of marginalized communities, we along with other donors also partner on a project called FETA, Fair Energy Transition for All. And FETA is carrying out focus groups in nine EU countries to be sure that um, lawmakers in Brussels can come closer and hear the needs on the ground. Um, also in the built environment, public procurement plays an enormous role in spending. So therefore we partner with the Dutch on the CO2 performance ladder. That is a green public procurement best practice approach with the potential to leverage the tremendous buying power of the public sector in Europe. And in particular with regard to buildings and civic works. 
Now, no less um, important in our work is the work that we do on the real economy and finance. We partner with the World Green Building Council quite proudly on the Building Life Campaign to bring together all the market players to adopt whole life zero carbon targets for buildings, to construct European wide and national roadmaps that will inform and align many different stakeholders, to educate professionals in the use of harmonized calculation methods for embedded emissions so that there's a common language everyone speaks, and to support investors to include embedded emissions in their investment decisions. These kinds of things go hand in hand with other efforts that we support around corporate transition, the We Mean Business Coalition, the Science-Based Targets Platform, which also collaborate with the World Green Buildings, Buildings Council, Global ABC and C40. And finally, we support tools that are needed to make the transition possible and to monitor its change. So a group like the New Climate Institute examines supply chain targets in global aggregation reports on non-state action, and that informs the UNFCCC process. And things like the Platform for Carbon Accounting Financials, or PCAF, enables financial institutions uh, to account and reduce their financed emissions, including those from buildings. Let me just close by saying that the Build Upon 2, Build Upon Squared, creates a renovation framework that touches upon a key focal point for the transition to zero carbon economies. Renovating houses offers a tangible way to develop green housing solutions and bring down emissions in line with the Paris Agreement. And most importantly, it will breed solutions not only that protect our planet, but that will benefit the many families that live on it. So that's just a few thoughts from one philanthropy, and we are eager to see more philanthropies join this challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liz, very inspiring stuff. Um, great, well, we've heard from all four panelists. Um, so uh, we, we have some questions now for you, each of you. Um, and just a reminder to the audience that if you if you want to pose questions to the panel, please do uh, put them in the uh, go to the stage tab and put them in the Q and A box uh, and aim them at the at the uh, the, the main stage session um, so that we can pick them up. Um, but I'd like to start with um, a. a a, a general question, if I may, to you, Christina, given our, our theme this afternoon is is thinking about the, the sort of interplay of the different stakeholders, the public and the private. Um, the World Green Building Council's Net Zero Carbon Buildings Commitment has signatories from both camps, if you like. So it has it has private companies signing, it has it has public entities signing. Uh, what do you think is 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 wh why is it important for cities, uh, other public authorities um, to, to make commitments like that. Um, we've, we've heard a little bit from Liz, the kind of push from, from, uh, from their side on, on the, you know, driving the ambition of regulation, but what, what difference can a commitment make if a city is, is making that, that commitment? And why, why would you encourage cities to sign the net zero carbon buildings commitment? Yes, thank you. I would say, I would say to that, Stephen, <clears throat> that Cities, as our partners at C40 say, <laughs> move further faster in terms of also in ambition, in ambition and regulation. And um, we are coming to the 30 days before COP and governments are, and we are expecting that governments are going to make more serious commitments in their nationally ter determined contributions and that the Paris Agreement will continue to evolve and have a significant outcome in a month's time. But as that un unfolds, cities can take a huge leadership position in terms of unlocking this whole life carbon vision and making sure two things. One, that this uh, renovation wave, of course, doesn't, uh, it doesn't become carbon intensive. Yeah, we have to, it doesn't, if we, as we renovate, we cannot uh, lose track of, of the carbon, of the carbon goals, but also because Cities can come together and collaborate as signatories of a common voice, a common knowledge, a common commitment to share best practice and leapfrog and accelerate action in the transition. And um, for example, take, take the renovation challenges, and we've seen it in the Build Upon 2 project, how that platform enables collaboration. That is, I like to list unprecedented collaboration. Yeah, it's, it's even more deep. And as, as an expression of political will, if they sign a commitment like the Net Zero Carbon Buildings Commitment, then uh, we are, all of us, making sure that they are on the right journey. And they have a huge impact through the commitment in unlocking better public procurement. Cities are tremendous in that space. 
also making sure that clean construction happens as we think whole life. Uh, we think of performance-based uh, energy codes as we move from prescriptive to performance, and cities can do that much faster than national governments. And of course, uh, unlocking the vision of, of uh, closing the loops and the circular economy, helping no cities have deliver quality of life for citizens. And I guess what we have to bridge in the future is a dialogue between citizens and governments and local, national, about what carbon means, the benefits of this, but through the commitment we have, the World GBC one, there's 28 cities very, uh, very committed to this journey, plus so six states and regions and 109 businesses. So it's a journey where we are locking the barriers and we're better fit to addressing the challenge at the pace and scale we need. Thanks, Christina. And you, you touched on uh, the, the collaboration between the different levels of governance there. And uh, it was something that Liz mentioned as well. So perhaps, uh, Stefan, uh, if I could come to you on this point, what what do you think um, what, what do you think the, the different levels of administration, so EU, national and city uh, or local, uh, I should say, could do better to to work together. Now, you know what 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 or, or what's already happening, perhaps in in terms of that multi-level governance piece, um, and and how can we how can we improve that? Thank you very much, uh, Stephen, uh, for 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 the question. Um, also linking to what uh, the other panelists have said, um, um, the the cities are moving faster, they are in the driving seat. Um, we need to listen to the communities and the cities. Um, what are the barriers they are facing? Um, what are the, uh, the any impediments uh, in the in the broader regulatory framework, but also the funding available, uh, making sure that information flows um, um, effectively um, to uh, the, the idea of a one-stop shop uh, is to be mentioned here that basically uh, citizens but also um, actors, decision makers at the local level uh, can have easy access um, uh, to the whole range of necessary information because many people are not experts uh, from, a, from a technical point of view. They are committed to action but they, they need support um, to have easy and easy access to the relevant information mm -hmm. both from the technical but also the fin financing and regulatory tools um, and 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 what they can use to make it efficient. So um, a crucial element will be sharing of good practices uh, across the cities, across the member states, across international partners more broadly to learn from each other, uh, to see what works where and what are the um, conditions for success and also uh, lessons to be learned if something has not worked in a specific environment. The challenges are often different uh, in terms of how to implement it, but uh, often the same and, and very similar in terms of objectives. Um, and what we try to, to see is uh, at the EU uh, level, uh, what is the right calibration between uh, what we can do at the EU level in terms of setting up uh, a new framework for the member states to fill in uh, any EU requirements, uh, for instance, certain minimum energy performance standards, but also information tools, the energy um, um, the the the, the um, uh, certificates which we which we uh, which there are then building renovation passports really to to put in place an infrastructure which can be used and should be used and, and must be used and and filled in by the member states uh, through their uh, relevant uh, national um, um, rules, um, but in the interest of, of the, the local level, really, of the local decision maker. So that's why we have to listen so much uh, to, to what is happening, basically, uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, at that level, which really counts, uh, what obstacles are there. And I think uh, that requires uh, an open ear uh, and not just to pretend that we know everything better at the, at the central level. Uh, so it's a, a, a very strong bottom-up uh, component here. And I think we've tried to ensure that through our partnerships with cities, um, uh, with the committee of the regions, also in, in Europe and the different city um, initiatives uh, which exist, uh, also the, the Covenant of Mayors, for instance, and ensure also that the member states and encourage member states to have a, a very intensive dialogue across the various levels within a member state, uh, not to set policy basically in isolation at the, at the national level, 
but rather uh, a bottom-up process, very inclusive stakeholder uh, consultations and, and dialogue. And then when it comes to um, the local level, of course, uh, the local politicians have a particular role to, to encourage, to uh, promote, but also to have an open ear uh, for, for citizens to come together, to have uh, citizens-led initiatives, uh, neighborhood approaches, um, and, and really listen to what citizens would like to see as in terms of outcome. Uh, and that, of course, includes some of the uh, necessary actions to be taken, like reducing energy demand, um, integrating uh, renewable energy in the system. That is somehow, I would say, a common challenge for everybody, but there's a lot of uh, discretion, flexibility on other aims. What can be improved further? What are the local solutions? What other objectives do we want to um, reach um, in terms of um, uh, neighborhood green, uh, greening the, the, the city, uh, transport integration uh, and social aspects as well, how we want to live. And that I think will inspire then citizens and, and really, really bring them on board also because they will understand and, 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 and see and, and be fully committed that uh, they will have a better environment uh, to live in later on. Thank you, Stefan. Very comprehensive answer. And, and you've touched there on, on some of the multiple benefits of renovation, the social um, and, and other factors that, that a renovation can support. Um, perhaps I could come to you, David, for your views on this. And, and um, we're, later in the conference, we'll be, we'll be hearing more about the, the renovation impact framework that the Build Upon Squared Consortium have been developing which is, is really about trying to capture some of those benefits more effectively. What, what do you see in terms of developments in the market that will support that, that will allow us to sort of better uh, track, um, you, you know, the, those, those wider benefits, not just the kilowatt hours saved, but, but how a renovation is, is having, you know, improving holistically the, the performance of the building. Are there any, any trends, any, any new, new advances that you see that, would, uh, that you'd like to share with us? So for sure, this uh, integrated approach uh, of how we measure and evaluate building um, is changing rapidly. Um, we've moved from a pure kilowatt hour per square meter uh, approach to uh, a much more holistic view with uh, uh, well-being, uh, thermal comfort, uh, indoor air quality, also uh, counting uh, as a very important uh, target. What we see um, developing is more and more capabilities to measure those parameters and so deliver not only the energy efficiency which is expected, but also monitor on a continuous basis the humidity, the temperature, the indoor air quality in the building we renovate. And um, at, for, for working with a, a renovation at a higher level of quality, what you very uh, often need is an aggregator so that you you reach a critical mass and you are able to afford uh, the technical assistance uh, and the, the better uh, design capabilities. So we've been working a lot with uh, social housing as a, a natural aggregator uh, with a concern to uh, improve uh, uh, the building, uh, the energy consumption, but also the well-being uh, for its occupant um, and also access to a, a lot of uh, uh, potential funding. Um, what surprised us is that um, when we finish a, a, a renovation and we've proven that uh, we've achieved the energy saving, very often uh, the uh, social company uh, that is funding the project is asking us to keep uh, the monitoring in place so that it can uh, monitor over time uh, what will be the comfort and how the house is being used by the occupants. So we see there a lot of potential developments and that's becoming very affordable. Uh, while in the past you would have to pay a few thousand euros per house, today for a few hundred euros you can have a, a perfectly uh, valid monitoring of uh, the conditions over time. Um, so that's a, a development we believe is going to uh, to change the way the market operates in the future. Thanks, David. That's uh, that's very encouraging to hear. Um, I've got a question here um, coming back to the the policy side of things. Um, uh, and uh, perhaps one of the more contentious uh, debates that's going on at the moment. Um, uh, so, Sh Stefan, I'll come to you, and then maybe others have have a view on this. Um, what's what's your views on on the challenges around uh, the proposal 
that, that's being discussed uh, of putting expanding the the emissions trading scheme to include buildings and uh, are there any insights that you can share uh, with with our audience around how those some of those challenges will be addressed thanks a lot uh, for, for for the question so um what what we consider at the at the commission is that basically we need several tools several um legislative but also other tools funding um uh, information tools um uh, encouraging um exchanges of of information across the borders but on the regulate regulatory side uh, the ets is is part of the solution because it addresses uh, some of the um uh, important financial um, aspects it creates incentives to move in the right direction um, but that of course has to be accompanied by by other uh, regulatory tools and very important uh, the social climate fund to 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 to, to buffer uh, any undesirable negative consequences for for citizens and and that is crucial of course to create the right incentives um, to really look at the different barriers see where where things are not um, yet sufficiently um put in place um to to move the entire building stock in the right direction notably on on heating and cooling uh, and there we do have also an important economic uh barrier uh in terms of uh, prices uh, the prices need to uh, of heating fuels need to encourage renovations uh, modernization of heating and cooling systems and that helps is part of the solution it's not the only solution can certainly not uh, do the trick alone that's why we also need the um, energy performance and buildings directive and the energy efficiency directive and a number of other related uh, tools uh, including the link to transport um, uh, the alternative fuels infrastructure um, 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 instrument which which also works very closely together with the energy performance and buildings directive um, so um, this is what basically was done uh, in the analysis supporting the, the, the so-called uh, FIT 455 um, uh, package uh, to see how everything plays together to overall deliver on what we need to do uh, for the buildings. But um, I would say the biggest challenge is to get it right also on the, on the social side and not to basically disadvantage uh, people who are vulnerable, um, that they would have to shoulder an undue burden uh, coming from an increase in in heating costs um so that basically uh, is is a proposal which the commission put on the table at the same time um so uh, and and there we need to get it right in the negotiations that this is properly put in place um and and reinforces each other otherwise we would not have the necessary acceptance uh, from citizens and it would simply be unfair and unjust uh, to um uh, to solve it via the price uh, alone, and we don't do it alone. Yeah? So, but it, it is to also try to solve it via the price of of heating and cooling fuels. Thanks, Stefan. And um, perhaps I think we've got time for perhaps just one more um, question, or if I can be slightly cheeky, I'll give you two questions to Liz here. Um, so, firstly, following directly on from that point that uh, we've just heard from Stefan. You mentioned this in your opening remarks. You've got some concerns about uh, the impacts, the social impacts of the ETS. So perhaps if you could uh, just maybe respond to what Stefan has just said. Um, and then we have a question from, from a member of the audience uh, asking for a little bit more detail about what you've said. You mentioned that you're doing work on, on the public procurement side of things. Uh, and there's a request if you could give a little bit more detail on what that looks like, who's involved, um, and what are the aims of that work? What are you trying to do around public procurement? Sure. Thank you, Thank you Stephen. Uh, well, you know, on the ETS, I would far, far be it for me, I'm not an expert on the, uh, the intricacies of the emissions trading system. But, and I, and I do appreciate the role that the Social Climate Fund will play, of course, in alleviating burdens. I suppose that our big concern is that if uh, we are looking at a time frame where we need to dramatically accelerate the innovation and conformity by the construction industry and the trade to really create a stronger um, performance, 
that putting including buildings in the emission trading system is going to slow that process down and it's going to create a lot of um, undesirable outcomes as a result or perhaps the, the kind of negative externalities that we would hope to avoid at this point. So I hope that's given more consideration because if, if government is only using its funds to bail out when there are problems rather than to stimulate the best possible practice at the same time, um, that would be unfortunate. So, uh, but I'm sure it's a much deeper debate that we don't have time for here. So those are my, uh, some thoughts. On the procurement system, uh, let me explain why I think it's such an important thing and, and why we're excited about funding this partner. When you think about it, um, across all of Europe, 1.8 trillion euros is spent every year on public procurement, and that's a very sizable amount of money. And when you consider what procurement tries to do, essentially governments in acting its, you know, carrying out its own duties and, and trying to spend money on behalf of the people is looking to create tenders that will um, fundamentally give the taxpayer the best bang for the buck, we might say, the best value for money. And so as a result of it, it's always been predicated on the idea that the lowest cost bid should win, or other factors, of course, included. What the CO2 performance ladder does is essentially change that and turn it on its head and says and creates standards by which companies go up the ladder based on their ability to reduce emissions in carrying out their activities. So rather than cost being the determining factor, um, clean and green is the determining factor. And this is a system that has been worked on for more than a decade in um, the Netherlands. And based on its uh, success and its performance, I think there are about 3,000 companies, if not more, that are currently using it in bids with the Dutch government. We decided that this would be an interesting thing to scale, not to say that there are not other green procurement mechanisms out there, but this one has had a particular notable success. And so we are funding its expansion and testing in other markets to see where it might be applied in Europe and how it might be customized to the local circumstances of a particular nation. Fascinating stuff. Thank you, Liz. And unfortunately, that is all we have time for for this pl first plenary. Uh, as Liz has said, I'm sure we could carry on some of these discussions for another hour or so. Um, but I, I would like to just thank very much our panel. Uh, it's been great to have you with us. Thank you for giving us your your time and your inputs. Um, I'd invite you to join the rest of the session if you, if you're if you have time and interest. We have some fascinating speakers coming up and some great thematic breakouts. Um, so you can move across to hop in and and uh, participate participate. Um, but uh, yeah, for now, uh, thank you. And uh, I'm sure I can speak for the whole audience when I say it's been a really, really fascinating discussion. So uh, with uh, uh, we'll, we'll move on, we'll move straight to our next session. Um, uh, in, in the panel discussion we've just heard, our speakers gave us quite a high level view of what's going on sort of across the value chain, across the public and private sector. Um, We've heard uh, about the different ways that the Commission is supporting the renovation wave, what the private sector can do, and so forth. And now we're gonna we're gonna dive uh, a little bit deeper into the details of particularly of the the Build Upon Squared project. So things will get progressively more focused as we go through the afternoon, and and particularly as we then later move into our thematic breakout sessions. Before we go there, uh, we're now going to hear several presentations from. Uh, different people who've been involved in the Build Upon Squared project in different ways, uh, and, and specifically about this renovation impact framework that we've started to hear about a little bit this afternoon already, that the project has been developing and piloting uh, alongside a group of some 30 cities or so now across Europe. So uh, I'll introduce our speakers to you. Uh, we have, first of all have uh, Marion Jamé, who's Head of Policy and Advocacy at the Irish Green Building Council. Uh, Marion is responsible for uh, IGBC's policy and advocacy campaigns. She also manages several projects in the area of energy efficient renovation. And she'll be telling us a bit more about what this renovation impact framework is and what it does. Then we'll hear from uh, Giovanni Vicentini. I hope I've pronounced that approximately correctly. He's a sustainability technical officer at the municipality of Padova in Italy. 
and uh, Giovanni has worked for the municipality since 2019 and was previously as uh, working as a consultant uh, for a number of Italian local authorities in in the areas of energy management and environmental projects so has a lot of experience in this background and he'll be sharing some of the work that has been happening in the city of Padova and their experiences of piloting this impact framework and then we'll hear from uh, Manuel Saravia who is the deputy mayor and town planning and housing councillor at the city of Valladolid in Spain. And uh, not only is he a deputy mayor and therefore a political leader, he also has a PhD in architecture and is a full professor of urban planning. Uh, so uh, a lot of experience and, and knowledge of this, this sector and of our topic at hand. Um, and he's been at the Valladolid School of Architecture since 1990. So, uh, and also, uh, uh, while I'm introducing Manuel, I would just say those of you who joined us for the first Build Upon Squared Summit in Brussels in 2019 will recall that at that time, uh, the city of Valladolid um, announced that they would join the Net Zero Carbon Buildings Commitment, um, which Christina has already spoken about a little bit in the, in the previous session. So we're delighted that Manuel is, is here today and will share the experiences from Valladolid of testing the pilot. And Manuel will be presenting in Spanish. So for those of you in the audience who, like me, don't actually know the Spanish word for renovation wave, um, we are joined by uh, Christian Gonzalez, who is um, going to be translating the presentation into English. But first of all, I would like to invite Marion onto the stage uh, and she'll, as I said, she'll introduce this, this renovation impact framework. So Marion, the floor is yours, over to you, thank you. Well, thank you, Stephen, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be here today for the launch of the Build Upon uh, Square uh, Framework, so a multi-level energy renovation framework. Um, as Raquel uh, already said, we have been working on that framework for a little bit more than two years, so we're very happy to launch it today. Uh, what I would like to do uh, in the next few minutes, um, I suppose, is uh, give you a little bit more information uh, on the framework, on its objective, and also on um, why and how uh, it was developed. So I suppose uh, what I would like to do first is to uh, take a step back and uh, to bring you back to 2017. Um, at the time, uh, the Irish Green Building Council, uh, alongside nine other uh, Green Building Councils in Europe, were working um, with the government uh, as part of the first build upon project um, to uh, co-design um, ambitious long-term renovation strategies. And uh, as you can imagine, with 10 countries uh, involved, uh, it was highly diverse. But what we did realize as well is that we were facing some uh, similar challenges and we had some similar recommendations. And some of these recommendations uh, are highly relevant, I suppose, in relation to the Build Upon Square framework. First of all, uh, it was clear to us uh, that we needed to avoid uh, a piecemeal approach to energy renovation. By that, I mean we needed better coordination between what was happening at local and national level. Uh, we also very much realized that we needed better quality data on the impact of energy renovation, um, especially the co-benefits. What we tried to do at the time was really to look at the various energy renovation uh, initiative happening in Europe. Uh, but what we found is that it was very difficult to find uh, quality data on the impact of these renovation initiatives. And when this data did exist, it was never captured uh, in a structured um, way, meaning it was very difficult to compare like for like. So that's very much uh, one of the reasons uh, why we started working on, on Build Up and Square. So let's look uh, more specifically uh, at the objectives uh, of the framework we are launching. Uh, first of all, I suppose uh, one of the key objectives is really to get better quality data on the impact of energy renovation um, at local level. And having this better data 
uh, should in turn, I suppose, support better decision making. Um, it would also help municipalities uh, in making a better business case for energy renovation. Let's say, for instance, when we're applying for funding for specific projects. Um, and I think, as it was mentioned in the previous session, it's also, I think, a good way to support engagement with a wider audience. Um, perhaps homeowners um, may know may not always be interested in when we talk about energy efficiency, but I think when we start looking at other aspects such as comfort, indoor air quality and so on, it might be um, an easier way, I suppose, to engage with a, a wider audience and to ensure really like citizens are at the center of the transition. Now, how was the framework uh, developed? Um, so we have been working on the development of the framework with uh, eight green building councils, uh, BPIE and Climate Alliance representing the uh, Convenant of Mayors. Uh, the first thing that we did was uh, intensive uh, desk research and um, consultation with the eight uh, project um, steering group in the eight countries plus our European um, uh, advisory board. Once we were happy with um, the drafts we have managed to, de to develop uh, through that consultation process, uh, we started um, testing um, the framework with the eight um, pilot uh, cities. We also got uh, additional feedback from the 25 follower municipalities. Um, and I think this tasting phase uh, was critical to ensure the framework, uh, we developed a, a robust framework, but also to ensure um, we have a framework that is um, usable and suitable for a variety of municipalities and not only for um, large uh, cities. So uh, again, really would like to thank uh, the project steering groups, um, the advisory board, but also like the 33 uh, cities uh, that were involved um, directly in the testing phase or just by providing uh, additional feedback. Now let's have a look um, at the framework uh, itself. Uh, so the framework uh, is made up of uh, three categories of indicators. We have environmental indicators, social indicators, focusing very much on health and well-being, and economic indicators. Um, the framework was developed to be used um, across Europe. So um, as you can imagine, as is has presented some challenges, and it means as well that the framework has to be uh, flexible. And by that, I mean, we need, it needs to be flexible in the way it's used or in the type of buildings uh, it is used, at least initially. Um, I mean, the framework has been designed to be used on all types of buildings, but um, initially it might be the case that some local authorities may only use it on the municipal building stock or on social housing, for instance. And that's also um, in terms of uh, flexibility, um, I suppose that also why I would like to highlight that it can either be used at municipal level, so on all the building stock, or um, to assess a specific um, renovation initiative, for instance, let's say to look at the impact of um, the renovation of the, the number of social housing. What is important as well is that the framework uh, does not define um, any renovation goals per se. It's it, it's not there uh, to define new goals. Uh, the goals that are included in the framework are national and local municipal goals that have been that have already been set up, but it does uh, support municipalities in capturing data in a standardized um, framework. So that's very much a, a data management tool, and because we do not want it to be uh, too burdensome uh, for municipalities uh, using the framework, we have tried to align it as much as possible with existing reporting uh, procedures, uh, such as the Convenant of Mayor or uh, National Climate Action Plan uh, at national level, for instance. Very briefly, and you can find far more information on the indicators on the World GBC website, uh, but the framework, as I said, is made of uh, 13 uh, indicators. So we have uh, four environmental indicators. So these include uh, looking at the energy renovation rate, 
looking at reduction in CO2 uh, emission, um, at improvement uh, in energy efficiency, and at also um, increase in um, renewable uh, energy production linked to energy renovation. When we look at the social uh, indicators, uh, we also have four indicators. So very much looking at reducing energy poverty, um, improving indoor air quality, but also improving winter and summer thermal comfort. Uh, we also have uh, five uh, economic uh, indicators. So that's the investment in energy renovation, uh, energy efficiency of the investment, looking at jobs supported uh, by um, energy renovation, looking at the level of upskilling uh, taking place, uh, and also really much financial savings uh, linked to energy renovation, because we felt that it's important that renovation is not only perceived uh, as a cost. And just again, perhaps to make my presentation uh, a little bit more concrete, although I'm sure uh, my colleagues from Padova and Valladolid uh, will do that, but that's just an example of how um, the results, I suppose, of uh, an energy renovation project uh, could be presented uh, if the framework uh, was used. So that's just an example using our um, Irish uh, pilot city, Dublin, but that just like just to show you, I suppose, also if you were using the framework at scale, you could use it to better communicate the impact of energy renovation and engage with better engage with citizens. So that's really it for me uh, in a nutshell. Um, thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to the Q and A session. Fantastic! Thank you very much, Maria. That's great. Um, so we'll move straight on to our next speaker who is uh, Giovanni from the city of Padova. Uh, Giovanni is going to tell us a, a bit about their experiences of piloting this framework that Marion has just uh, given us an overview of. So Giovanni, over to you, the floor is yours. So uh, hello everybody and good afternoon. Thank you for, for inviting me to this uh, presentation of the application of the build up most framework uh, in our municipality. So today I'm uh, going to present, uh, yeah, uh, our municipality, the approach we decided to include in uh, our SECP mainly, so the Sustainable Energy Action Plan. And as you can see, the first slide is uh, related to the, yeah, to the location of Padova, probably the most of you uh, already know the position, but we are in the north of Italy, very really close to Venice, uh, and we are probably uh, famous uh, in Europe at least uh, for our UNESCO sites, so the historical city center and also the Botanical Garden and the Scroveni Chapel, so painters from the 13th century. So today I would like to present you, yeah, this process. So we started uh, almost uh, 20 years ago with the first municipal energy plan. And now we approved the setup of the municipality and we included uh, all the knowledge from the build a phone square, uh, framework in this document, which is really important to us because it's setting uh, our ambitions, our goals uh, towards 2030. So we are including all the actions, of course, also concerning the building sector uh, for the next decade. So uh, this slide just presents you the two main milestones of our process. The first one was the SEAP uh, 10 years ago with a target year to 2020 and the new one, the SECAP, which is like yeah, uh, uh, an improvement uh, of the SEAP uh, and the inclusion of the, this new topic of adaptation to climate change. And this is an action plan, yeah, of course, for our municipality, for the entire territory, not only for the municipality itself, but for the entire territory also concerning the residential sector, the tertiary sector and the mobility. And the SECAP is made by six pillars. So we dedicated one entire pillar to uh, the efficient city. So dedicated to the renovation of the building stock, private and public, of course. But we have also included some action concerning the building sector in the, in the sixth pillar, which is a more resilient city. So we tried to includes also adaptation measures concerning the building sector. And here you can see more or less how we are trying to tackle the, these, uh, these two topics. So uh, for what concern, of course, mitigation, we are moving towards the energy efficiency, renewable energy, energy management, et cetera. But we also decided to, to look at the other face of the, of the coin. So the adaptation to trying to push our market, uh, local market, and also the citizens and 
all the other stakeholders and actors working at local level in adaptation to climate change, also in the building sector. So reducing the contribution of buildings to the urban Thailand effect, trying to greening the buildings, so the green roofs, uh, green facades, etc. trying to include uh, somehow the water management uh, in the new buildings, but also in case of refurbishment, deep refurbishment of existing buildings, and trying to reduce more or less the soil consumption, so try to push a lot on the refurbishment and uh, reducing the soil consumption. So as a municipality, we, we can act in two different uh, fields. We have, of course, a big stock building stock um, owned by ourselves. So we have schools, we have offices, we have more than 100,000 square meters of building stock. So we have to act directly in the refurbishment of the municipal buildings. Then, uh, of course, as mentioned in the, in the last session, we have also the great opportunity of the green public procurement to yeah, somehow uh, give a direction to the procurement in our city. And then, of course, we can act uh, on the private sector, which is probably the most important for us, because if you look at the, yeah, the, the, the pie of the emissions of our territory, only the 3% uh, belong to the municipality itself, and the 97 belong to the private sector. Of course, only, uh, not, not only the building sector, but also the mobility one. And if we speak about indirect actions, we can, of course, uh, uh, act at local level with, the, with our municipal regulatory framework. So we are setting new rules for our citizens in case of new buildings or deep refurbishment of existing buildings. And we are also able to provide uh, additional incentive schemes for our citizens. And uh, of course, we can act and we are acting at local level with the constitution, the, the establishment of a one-stop shop in our municipality. We have a dedicated project for that. This is a, a, an H2020 project, part of a fit expanded. And we are working, of course, with the other stakeholders, private mainly at local level, to set up this one-stop shop and to somehow merge the demand and the supply side. So providing not only informative solution to the citizens, but also technical and financial solution. All, uh, all these solution in one single point, of course, as is the one-stop shop. We'll, we work a lot on communication side uh, as municipality. This is probably one of our main uh, tasks. And uh, we decided to include in the SECAP, uh, but also in the uh, build up uh, framework, uh, the, the new policies for families in energy poverty, because of course, as municipality, as local authority, this is a crucial aspect of our, uh, of our policies, of course. And we, we come to the build upon square framework and integration in the SECAP. So we decided to work on two levels, uh, both on, at the building level, mainly with our buildings. So the buildings belonging to the municipality itself and also at city level. So more to monitor what is happening on the whole. So putting together all the measures, all the interventions occurring at the, at the territorial level. So public and private also. And we decided to identify, together with the support of the GBC Italy and, of course, entire consortium, two different types of indicators. So the results one, which are measuring directly what is happening at the building level in the single building, for example, in a school, but also impact indicators, which are more limited in number and are able to monitor what is happening at the city level. So, and this is of course crucial for this uh, covenant of major uh, initiative because we, we set an ambitious goal towards 2030 and with the impact indicators, we are able to monitor it, to track it and to understand if the measures we are putting in place are effective or not. And what is important for monitoring, what we find out uh, together with the, in the, with the, the support of Bid Upon Square, we understood that uh, two main aspects, that it is important for us to have quantitative indicators, numbers, because if we have a plan, if we have a, a trend, if we have some goals, quantitative goals, we also, have, we also need uh, quantitative indicators. And what is difficult to us is not to monitor directly the, the single building, the intervention, the effectiveness of the intervention, the, the kilowatt towers uh, consumed before and after, which is also important to us. But what is important also is the how to monitor a policy because a municipality always have a lot of policies, for example, the policies for energy poverty families. And together with Bilapon Square Framework, we uh, identify few indicators, quantitative indicators, also to monitor the a policy, which is not so easy. 
the second aspect we considered in the in the project is the, the source of the data because uh, this is a big amount of uh, of data we need you can consider that in our setup we have more than 100 actions more or less uh, 30 of them concern the building sector each action has two different indicators to be monitored so we have more or less each year 60 data to be collected to monitor and to track the evolution of our setup. And so we have to take into consideration uh, which is the source of this data. So somehow we understood that the, the, the source is internal. So we internal from the municipality itself. And uh, in this regard, together with the Build Upon Square framework, we uh, set up an internal working group, putting together some uh, reference persons from all the sectors of the municipality. And in other cases, uh, we, we need to, to go out, to go to the other stakeholders, not only at local level, but sometimes at the, the regional or national level. So we have yeah, a very vertical uh, cooperation and governance. And we prepared, for example, together with uh, Valentina from CBC Italia, uh, some memorandum of understanding so to have, uh, yeah, uh, a standard data flow so to to be able to collect each two year each one year the data we need to monitor everything so sometimes we have to go outside sometimes we just need to to be able to interact with the other departments in our municipality uh the last few slides this is more or less how our setup and the list of actions with the monitoring uh, indicators appear in our setup so we have the action we have the the, the results indicator and what is important, of course, is to uh, identify the correct unit of measurement, the data source, as well, I mentioned before. And in this case, for example, we prepare a memorandum of understanding together, uh, which is uh, yeah, a, a contract more or less between the municipality and ENEA, which is the National Energy Agency, providing a lot of data to us. We are asking them with a certain frequency. So each year we are providing them uh, a, a, a template to collect the data and they are providing back the data fill in. So we are really able to monitor and to track everything. And here you can see uh, the, the, the last column, uh, you can see the integration of the framework of build upon into our SICAP. This is the last slide, of course. So we set a goal towards 2030, which is uh, uh, this one, more or less halving the, the emissions in our territory. As municipality, so the, 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 the council decided also to set an ambitious goal towards 2050 in line with the currently the, the, the last decision of the European Commission and the European institutions. So we are also trying to identify a long-term uh, perspective, a pattern and a, a long-term action plan, which is not so easy to be implemented because yeah, really we, we need a vision uh, in for the, in the next 30 years. But the, the framework uh, and the indicators are crucial for us to evaluate the results each year, each two year, and to be able also to identify the effectiveness of the actions and some, sometimes to identify new actions to be included to be able to uh, to reach the, the the final goal thank you so much for having invited me uh, i'm disposed for uh, further questions from the audience thank you fantastic thank you giovanni uh, um, inspiring to see how much effort has gone into uh, testing this framework and, and great to see some of the insights that are coming out of it. And it'll be particularly interesting to compare the experience in Padova in, in Italy with the experience from Valladolid in Spain. Um, so I'll now uh, welcome to the stage uh, Manuel Saravia, uh, as I said before, Deputy Mayor and Town, Plan Town Planning and Housing Councillor. Uh, for the city of Erdenbuz. And of course, uh, accompanying him, Christian Gonzalez, who is going to be translating. And this is, uh, you don't need to worry about picking the right audio channel. It would be a, a, a consecutive translation. So Manuel will, will present a short, uh, a short section and then we'll uh, hand over to Christian to translate um, uh, for him. So Manuel and Christian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Bien, buenos días, muchas gracias. Vamos a comenzar eh, con, con las primeras diapositivas. La primera, eh, pasamos. Next, please. Next. Perfecto. Para entender este proyecto, no estaría mal verlo como obligación intergeneracional, porque con él estamos haciendo lo que nos pedían las generaciones anteriores y nos demandan las posteriores. 
Primero fue la ecología urbana en asociaciones ciudadanas y en la universidad. Después se habló de sostenibilidad en la práctica municipal ya y, y ahora en la actualidad eh, se habla de la descarbonización, un concepto que implica a toda la población. Hello, good morning to everyone, uh, good afternoon, and thank you. First, uh, to understand this project, one should see it as an intergenerational obligation because we're doing what previous and, and future generations demand from us. As in so many cities, in Valladolid, it was first about urban ecology with citizen associations and the university. Then there was talk of sustainability, which became embedded in the city's policies. And in recent years, this has been, there has been a critical demand, decarbonization. Next. Think. Eh, pero antes de seguir, vamos a, a dar algunos datos de Valladolid. Valladolid tiene ahora 300.000 habitantes, 22.000 edificios, de los que más de 2.000 son edificios públicos, y cerca de 160.000 viviendas, la mayoría construidas en los años 60 y 70, lo cual condiciona decisivamente cualquier propuesta de rehabilitación general. But first, let us look at some data on the city. Valladolid has now 300,000 inhabitants and 2, uh, sorry, 22,000 buildings, of which more than 2,000 are public buildings and about 160,000 um, homes. Most of them were built in the 60s and 70s, and this has a decisive impact on any proposal, proposal for general renovation. Obviamente, se viene trabajando desde hace años por mejorar el comportamiento medioambiental de la ciudad y especialmente en los últimos años, en infraestructuras, en el control de la energía, implantación de paneles solares, actuaciones en barrios, nuevo planeamiento general de 2020, nuevo plan de movilidad de 2021, implantación de zona de bajas emisiones en 2022, está previsto, Política fiscal y estímulos a la rehabilitación des, desde 2016, nuevo plan de vivienda en 2021, plan de arbolado en 2021 y propuestas de financiación con fondos europeos, de las que destaca una propuesta de rehabilitación del norte y del este de la ciudad. Obviously, we have been working for years to improve the city's environmental performance, and especially in recent years, we have worked on the following. Infrastructures, energy control, installation of solar panels in all public buildings, actions in neighborhoods, a general, a new general planning, a final approval was in 2020, a new mobility plan in 2021, low emission zone, which is underweight and expected to be completed in 2022, fiscal policies and incentives for rehabilitation since 2016, a new housing plan approved in September 2021, a tree plan, and now other actions and proposals financed with European funds. Um, among them, a proposal for the renovation of half the city, which is the north and east areas of Valladolid. No es fácil medir los avances de la descarbonización. El Ayuntamiento de Valladolid se incorporó en 2019 a Bildapón al cuadrado y en ese mismo año aprobó una moción de adhesión al compromiso cero carbono en la edificación, un compromiso que se presentó en Bruselas en diciembre de 2019. It is not easy to measure progress in decarbonization. The city of Valladolid joined Build Upon Square Spain in 2019, and in December that year, a motion of adhesion to the net zero carbon buildings commitment was approved. And these uh, commitments were presented in Brussels in the framework of uh, um, delivering net zero carbon buildings for all, Build Upon European's Leader Summit in December 2019. Thanks. Next. La eficacia de las medidas medioambientales reclama la participación y una buena difusión de los proyectos. Están en marcha reuniones y acuerdos con colegios profesionales, universidades, organizaciones empresariales, sindicales, ecologistas y vecinales. Y se aprovechará el actual proceso de redacción de la Agenda, de la agenda 2030 para promover una mayor participación. Perdón. 
Effective um, environmental measures require participation and also good dissemination of the projects. And this has been so far based on um, meetings with professional associations, with universities, also with businesses, trade unions, and also environmental and neighborhood um, organizations. And we will also take advantage of the ongoing process of dra drafting the 2030, 2030 agenda uh, with the proposals for decarbonization will be regarded as a critical issue. Next, next, please. Eso. Muy bien. Una vez determinado el marco de indicadores, hay que ver cómo incorporarlo a la práctica municipal. Para ello se cuenta con el Instituto de la Construcción de Castilla y León, un trabajo que no es fácil, por los problemas de interpretación y traslación a la práctica de cada ayuntamiento. Un elemento de trabajo fundamental es la herramienta Reaviva, para la recopilación y creación de una base de datos completa que permita analizar todos los expedientes municipales de rehabilitación energética. Once a framework of indicators has been determined, it is necessary to see how to incorporate it into municipal practice. For this purpose, we are working with the Castilla y León Construction Institute. Uh, the work entrusted to us is not easy. There are still problems with uh, the interpretation and translation of the generic terms to each municipality. A fundamental working tool has been Reaviva for the compilation and creation of a complete database. This tool makes it possible to analyze all the municipal energy renovation files. Next. Gracias. Sin embargo, esa recopilación de datos no es fácil, puesto que genera una enorme casuística al incorporar datos que hasta ahora no se exigen y datos de otras administraciones que no se tienen, pero se avanza decididamente. Va a ser especialmente útil tanto la aprobación de una nueva ordenanza como la definición de acuerdos con otras administraciones. But compiling this data is not easy since it generates an enormous caseload and it seeks to incorporate data that were not required in ordinary files until now or data coming from other administrations. However, progress in, is being made and it's going to be useful to have a new municipal ordinance that is being passed and also adopting agreements with other administrations. Next. Como digo, la ordenanza, los acuerdos interadministraciones y la incorporación a la Administración Municipal de Reaviva constituirán la columna vertebral del sistema de control de la descarbonización inmobiliaria de la ciudad. Y así, al disponer de los datos desagregados y completos, se podrán cruzar y evaluar y mejorar las políticas municipales. As I was saying, this municipal ordinance and the agreements between different administrations, together with the incorporation of the Reaviva instrument into the municipal administration, will constitute the backbone of the control system for the decarbonization of buildings in our city. So having disaggregated and complete data available will enable us to cross-check and evaluate them. We will also have um, information on the impact of energy renovation, and this will help us improve the policies in our city. Muy bien. Y acabo. La ciudad de Valladolid tiene en estos años un buen impulso vital. Su marco de desarrollo está equilibrado. El ecosistema urbano está razonablemente cuidado, aunque mejorará con este trabajo. Pero hagamos una última consideración. El edificio donde se encuentran las oficinas municipales de urbanismo se denomina patio de la hospedería, pues fue efectivamente hospedería durante siglos. Queremos que sirva este término como mejora del trabajo en marcha, pues con él se trata de seguir impulsando una ciudad más hospitalaria, cumpliendo así lo que los primeros ecologistas de los años 60, con visión de futuro, ya nos reclamaban. Muchas gracias y muchas gracias, Cristian. And finally... Um, the city of Valladolid has a vital momentum. Its development framework is well balanced, the urban ecosystem is reasonably well cared for, and it continues to advance. Having said this, let me share a final thought. 
the building where the city's urban planning office is located, it's called the Patio de la Hospedería, the hostelry, because it was, in fact, a hostelry for centuries. Uh, we want this term to serve as a metaphor for the work in progress, because the idea is to continue promoting a more hospitable city, thus fulfilling what the first ecologies of the 1960s, who had a very clear vision of the future, were already demanding from us. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, both Manuel and Christian for that presentation and for those inspiring closing words. Uh, I love that idea, uh, a hospitable city. And uh, yeah, we, we do hope that uh, all of the work that's being catalyzed through the Build Up On Squared uh, project is contributing in some way to that, that vision of a, a city that is, is, is really ha has people at its heart. Um, uh, we, we do have just a, a couple of minutes left, um, probably time for one question, I think. Um, I have a question which I would like to pose to both our city speakers, if that's okay. Um, so I recognize we'll need to, to have the translation. Um, but the question is, is quite a simple one, but I guess uh, touches on one of the challenges of the framework and testing the framework. The, qu the question is, who collects the data? in the end how is that resourced uh, are people in the city collecting yeah wh wh whose role is that so perhaps if i could ask uh, uh, giovanni first and then we'll come to to manuel and, and christian for a translation yeah this is a good question <laughs> yeah in our case for the municipality as a uh, yeah probably i mentioned before we uh, try to create an internal working group in our municipality. So identifying for each department responsible for some actions, of course, one reference person. And we are, as environmental department, the coordinator of, of the internal working group. So we prepared like a, a framework, the, the one from the Build Upon Square. And we, we, we are sharing this framework with our, our the other members of the internal working group. We explain the framework to the others and with a certain frequency, depending on the action and depending on the indicators, we are trying to collect the data. So we are the coordinator. This is for what concern the, the data collected internally. But of course, we, as I mentioned before, we have to collect also data from outside. So from the region, uh, the national level, some agencies, etc. In that case, we prepare some uh, structure, yeah, databases, and the memorandum understanding. Uh, and we also uh, are directly involved as a municipality, as uh, environmental department, to the in the data collection, and also in the data uh, management. And uh, we prepare, of course, each two years for the Covenant of Major a document. Uh, showing the results of the the collection, of course, and showing yeah the the, the pattern and the, if the roadmap is correct uh, compared to what we planned for 2030, our objectives to 2030. So ourselves, <laughs> very shortly. <laughs> Thanks, Giovanni, and over to Manuel. Bien, eh, nosotros creemos que los datos se deben recoger en el ayuntamiento y para lo cual hacemos un programa informático Reaviva para ordenar los datos y una ordenanza municipal para que, para que todos los que trabajan en rehabilitación aporten datos y acuerdos con otras administraciones para que nos aporten datos. Con los datos de las administraciones, de, la, de quienes rehabilitan edificios, quienes trabajan y los del ayuntamiento, tendríamos el programa completo. So we believe that the data must be compiled at the city council. Uh, so we're using this instrument, Reaviva, in order to um, order to to provide some order um, in those data. And we have a um, municipal ordinance that has been passed that requires that everyone who works with the renovation data um provide those data to the city council we also have agreements with other administrations for them to give us the data and so this will provide for a very complete data framework fantastic thank you both for that, those responses and and we do have time for just one more question uh, uh, this is a question for Marianne. um Marianne, you mentioned um 
uh, some work being done in Ireland. Uh, you mentioned 300 homes being renovated. The question is, uh, what was actually done, and, and is is there any any insight from the framework that would you know sort of support the prioritization of of choosing which are the most important measures to implement in a in an energy efficient renovation on on homes? Yeah, I should have been clearer, but I was a bit tight on time. But just on that, um, the data actually on that slide are not accurate data. It was really developed from a pure design point of view to show how it could work. Um, so the project uh, Dublin City Council are working on at the moment, it's uh, a social housing. So I think they have 161 homes that are being retrofitted. Uh, the data are not there yet, uh, but um, the way they are approaching it is uh, still very much a, a fabric first approach. So making sure of improving uh, energy efficiency first. And they are also looking for the first time at um, incorporating uh, heat pumps uh, in this arm because it's part of our national climate action plan in terms of the target for the, the social housing stack. Thank you, Marion. And that brings us to the end of this session. Uh, so uh, remains for me to say thank you to all of you. Thank you, Marion. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you, Christian. Uh, we really appreciate your, your time and, and the, the insights that you've shared. And thank you particularly to uh, the, the two cities for all of the effort and time that has gone into uh, supporting the project and the development of this impact framework um, has been so valuable. We have two elements left uh, for you. Um, uh, the first is, and slight risk here for those who heard, who caught the technical glitches earlier. We're gonna we're gonna take a risk and try again with a, a different video this time. Uh, we have a, a video uh, showcasing some of the pilot cities from the Build Up On Squared project. You've heard from some of them already live. We just have some short clips from a few of the others uh, to to share with you now this afternoon. So if again, if our tech team could tee that up, and we uh, yeah we'll all. Uh, Hope and pray that it works. Thank you. Hola, soy Manuel Sarabia, arquitecto, teniente de alcalde del Ayuntamiento de Valladolid, concejal de Planeamiento Urbanístico y Vivienda y represento al Ayuntamiento en este año. Valladolid tiene ya mucha experiencia, yo creo que no, no acaba de empezar en estos temas, sino que viene trabajando en rehabilitación energética desde hace bastantes años. La propuesta, el marco, la herramienta con lo que estamos trabajando de Bildapón al cuadrado es eh, una herramienta necesaria. Yo creo que si no fuese esta tendría que ser otra muy parecida, pero del mismo rango, con estas características que eh, han sido muy desarrolladas, yo creo que de, a lo largo de muchas reuniones y que en estos momentos pienso que nos dan bastante confianza, que es lo necesario. Respecto a la contribución al cambio climático es evidente, creo que hay que darle pocas vueltas porque es evidente. Respecto a la contribución a que alivie la pobreza energética, pues creo que la palabra clave es esa, alivie, porque la pobreza es la que es, eh, solo se resuelve con medidas sociales y económicas de la, largo alcance, pero es verdad que si los consumos se reducen en energía, pues los consumos también, en la, en la carga que tiene también se reduce y se alivia un poco la pobreza. Welcome everyone from Budapest. It's important for the municipality of Budapest as a responsible city manager to make climate conscious decisions for the sustainable development of the town and to be able to prevent climate change at the settlement level and to provide appropriate answers to the challenges caused by the climate change. The town joined to the Covenant of Mayors in 2011 and prepared the Sustainable Energy Action Plan. In the action plan, we undertook to reduce the city's CO2 emissions by at least 20% by 2020. In 2020, we adopted our SECUP, in which we committed to a 40% reduction in CO2 by 2030. And this year, we adopted our local climate strategy. The framework of the build-up on square fits in very well with this strategy thinking, so Budaj was happy to join to the project and became a test city in Hungary. In the autumn of 2020, we introduced the framework to the relevant municipal staff and after testing the usefulness was confirmed. 
The framework is expected will be introduced at the municipality in September 2021 with the City Council approval. From the introduction, we expect that the municipality will address the effects of the city-level building renovation activities on a daily basis. The stakeholder colleagues can take part in further training in line with the framework. By collecting data on a regular basis, we can develop a monitoring system that will help more efficient and targeted municipal decisions and interventions that contribute to the long-term environmental sustainability of the city, achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. Hi, my name is Ali Graham. I'm the Dublin City Architect. Dublin City Council is a signatory to the Covenant of Mayors and we've been piloting the Build Upon framework in Ireland for the past year. Ireland has set ambitious climate targets to cut CO2 emissions in half by 2030 and to achieve climate neutrality by 2050. Depending on the direction we take, our buildings can help us address climate change or cause it to accelerate. Dublin City Council has an ambitious retrofit programme. This includes deep retrofitting 8,000 flats to NZEB standard by 2050. This is a huge challenge, but it's also an opportunity to not just cut emissions, but to improve the building's condition and to address social needs. So for example, as part of our retrofit programme, we often amalgamate existing vacant bedsits to create one bedroom flats. And we often seek to plug the gaps between existing buildings with new buildings wherever possible. This brings vacant bedsits back into use and it also improves the quality of the public realm. We've started to look at embodied carbon as a core principle. And to date, the Build Upon framework has allowed my team in City Architects to talk about energy retrofit and to raise awareness about the need for retrofit. When it comes to climate action, public bodies like Dublin City Council must lead by example. However, it's very difficult for client departments and indeed professionals to get their heads around the whole picture of retrofit benefit. The Build Upon framework allows local authorities to measure and record the impacts of their retrofit projects in a holistic manner, looking at CO2 emissions reductions, but also at the wider impacts such as the benefits to people's health and well-being and indeed reduction in energy poverty. In future, the Build Upon framework will help us in better considering and communicating the multiple benefits of retrofit, which in turn should increase the rate of retrofit. Thank you. Il Comune di Padova, oltre a intraprendere azioni per mitigare i cambiamenti climatici e adattarsi ai suoi effetti inevitabili, si è impegnato a ridurre la povertà energetica. Il primo passo da compiere è quello di conoscere le dimensioni del problema, realizzando alcuni studi che consentano di identificare in modo più puntuale le famiglie e gli individui più vulnerabili, preservando rigorosamente il loro diritto alla privacy. La collaborazione con il progetto Build Upon Two ha consentito una migliore definizione del concetto di povertà energetica, identificando parametri quali quantitativi per comprendere la portata del fenomeno, pianificare misure di supporto e monitorarne l'attuazione nel tempo. Un intero capitolo del PAESC di Padova è dedicato ai programmi di riqualificazione di edifici pubblici e privati della città. Sono previste complessivamente 19 azioni che includono una pluralità di interventi, dagli investimenti in efficienza energetica, alla produzione di energia da fonti rinnovabili, alle norme del regolamento edilizio che impongono il rispetto di standard prestazionali più elevati e di natura multisettoriale. Il PAESC ingloba al suo interno tutti gli interventi del piano triennale delle opere pubbliche, molti dei quali riguardano edifici della scuola dell'infanzia e primaria. Oltre a queste misure di breve periodo, sono state inserite previsioni al 2030 da concretizzarsi attraverso l'elaborazione di un programma pluriennale finalizzato all'identificazione di edifici comunali meno performanti su cui intervenire in forma prioritaria. Molte azioni del PAESC si riferiscono a edifici pubblici e privati gestiti da altri soggetti del territorio, tra i quali per esempio l'Università degli Studi di Padova, proprietario di un patrimonio immobiliare molto significativo all'interno della nostra città. 
Tutte queste misure dovranno essere monitorate nel tempo, attraverso indicatori e procedure predefiniti. Il progetto Build Upon Square ha consentito al Comune di Padova di individuare gli indicatori di impatto e di risultato più idonei, considerando non solo le ricadute ambientali, connesse alla riduzione dei consumi energetici e delle emissioni climaalteranti, ma anche a quelle sociali ed economiche che consentono un monitoraggio più efficace dello stato di attuazione del PAESC. So, we're all very grateful that that worked. Um, as you can see, Build Upon Squared has brought together stakeholders from right across Europe, uh, from cities, uh, but also uh, stakeholders from across the value chain uh, to work on this, this challenge of how do we renovate uh, not just hundreds, not just thousands, but literally tens of millions of buildings over the coming decades. And uh, we're, we're Coming to the end now, we, we kicked off the, the afternoon with some words from uh, our project coordinator, uh, Raquel from GBC España. I'm very pleased to be able to hand over now uh, for our closing keynote to our project officer, uh, who is Michele Sansoni. Uh, he's from uh, works for the European Commission, um, so he works in, in Cinea, which is Uh, I have to get this right. It is uh, the Climate, Infrastructure and Environment Executive Agency. Um, I hope I've got that correct. Uh, so Michele is, a, is a, a project manager there and is, is our designated project officer for uh, the Build Upon Squared project. And he's going to uh, close the day with a few remarks. And before I, I, I hand over to Michele, I will say that given that that video that ha, has, has worked and we've succeeded, we're going to take another risk. And once Michele has, has finished his, his presentation, we will try again with the address from Sean Kelly, which failed so miserably earlier on. We hope that some of you will, will be willing to stay around for that. And uh, if not, you'll see it online uh, in the coming days when we post it. But uh, Michele, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, regarding the acronym, we like to refer to CINEA as the Green Deal Agency of the European Commission, which is, might be easier to remind. And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I have to say, I still remember the kickoff meeting of Build Upon Square, which was held in uh, uh, June 2019 in Madrid, so a bit more than two years ago. I participated by video conference and only because I couldn't travel to Madrid at that time. Uh, and of course, at that time we had some connection issues before eventually managing to set everything up. Um, indeed, we've all made a lot of experience in running events since that moment. And now we can smoothly participate to big events and screen videos without any issue like today. Um, I also remember I shared with the consortium the high expectations of the agency and the commission on the project, uh, in particular regarding its potential to um, facilitate the decarbonization of the building stock at local level, influence policies and align local and national strategies, link decarbonization strategies with uh, local plans such as uh, CCAPs, and of course, support the different actors uh, who should create the conditions for the energy transition. In particular, um, I would remind city officers and decision makers. So from what I've seen over the past two years uh, during the implementation of, of the project and also so nicely presented and discussed today, those expectations were met and that potential was exploited. All of that, I have to say, despite the very different context and the many challenges posed by the pandemic, which were, of course, unexpected when the project kicked off. However, even if the context has changed so dramatically, the energy renovation challenges ahead of all of us in the building sector are more current than ever. And more than ever is decisive the contribution of the local level of our cities and regions to achieve the European carbon neutrality targets by 2050. So policymakers and administrations at all subnational levels, regions, provinces, cities, towns, they need to commit to and effectively plan the clean energy transition on their territory, on their energy systems and on their infrastructures, 
at an unprecedented level of ambition and pace with a long-term horizon. So the power of projects like Build Upon Square is that they not only support the change, but they create evidence on the ground that this change can happen. EU-funded projects inspire others to take action and they motivate and inspire cities across Europe to develop their own transition roadmaps, outlining the path that can bring us all forward towards the achievement of the 2050 targets. While listening to the results of the Build Upon 2 project in Spain, in Hungary, in Ireland and in Italy, we are already witnessing this change, something that proves that we can be ambitious yet concrete. So uh, the European support that contributed to the success of Build Upon 2, and this is good news, continues. And very recently, a new clean energy transition sub-program has kicked off under the LIFE program. In fact, this LIFE clean energy transition continues the successful journey of Horizon 2020 energy efficiency, which funded Build Upon Square. With another, another seven-year budget of almost one billion, the LIFE Clean Energy Transition Program has the key objective of creating market and regulatory enabling conditions for the clean energy transition. Moreover, it aims to contribute to the shift to a circular energy efficient, energy efficient renewable energy-based and climate resilient economy. So LIFE Clean Energy Transition is built around five areas of intervention which will support the building of a policy framework at all governance levels to support the clean energy transition the work related to building renovation uh, including construction skills uh, and the work on industry and smart services on heating and cooling and digitalization the mobili mobilization of private finance for sustainable energy which is also um, critical the, de the development of local and regional investment projects with the technical assistance, and last but not least, the involvement of citizens in the clean energy transition. So if you want to continue the successful path you started or the su successful path you witnessed today in this conference, I encourage you, all of you to check the opportunities provided by this new live clean energy transition program by visiting the website of CINEA, so the new European Commission Green Deal Agency. And before closing, uh, I would like to thank you uh, all and to thank in particular Build Upon 2 for inviting me to this event and congratulate them and the consortium on their achievements. Uh, I would like to, in particular, to thank Raquel and Emilio for their great leadership. So, um, my final words, keep up the good work, continue to lead, continue to share best practice and to take advantage of cross-border cooperation. Energy transition is not only a huge challenge, as we heard, but also a great opportunity for taking action and being part of the change. Because to build a sustainable energy future and to achieve the European energy and climate targets together, we need not only enhanced dialogue and long-term vision, but also concrete actions in our regions and cities. We will be there to support you. Thank you. Thank you, Michele, for those encouraging words. It's great to hear that uh, from your perspective that the project is, is achieving what it set out to achieve. Um, and as you said, despite all of the challenges that COVID has thrown, thrown our way. So uh, again, thank you for, for joining us this afternoon. Um, and uh, thank you, everybody who's, who's stuck with us this far. It's been a long afternoon. Um, as promised, uh, here now, just to close out, is hopefully the video from, uh, uh, from Sean Kelly um, uh, with his address. Um, but I will, uh, I will take the opportunity to wish you all a, a very good evening. And uh, yeah, once again, thank you for participating. We hope that you'll join us again soon for uh, future events and that you'll follow the project closely and stay in touch with us. Um, we really appreciate your time and your participation this afternoon. So with, with some closing words then, hopefully without any technical issues, here is uh, MEP Sean Kelly. Hello. It is the global 
Wardle Green Building Week, and that happily provides a platform to discuss an important part of Europe's plan for climate neutrality, the built environment. Unfortunately, I cannot be there to discuss this topic as I am a trade delegation trip, but I would like to thank the World Green Building Council and partners for allowing me to contribute to this discussion nonetheless. The European Union is currently undergoing an ambitious systemic shift in production and consumption patterns needed to align our economic growth with our climate objectives for the upcoming decades. With further electrification of transport, heating, etc., the energy system will represent the backbone of Europe's climate commitments. Within this, buildings are indispensable for reaching the EU's carbon neutrality, energy efficiency and renewable energy objectives. Reaching our climate targets without decarbonizing our living and working spaces, quite frankly, seems impossible. Indeed, they are responsible for 36% of greenhouse gas emissions and 40% of the energy consumption in the European Union. Yet, in today's Europe, 75% of buildings are not energy efficient, mostly because many of the buildings in use today were constructed before the current requirements were in place. The European Parliament has consistently advocated and pushed for ambitious EU climate commitments. With the Fit for 55 package, we stand over the largest single batch of legislation to tackle climate change proposed by any government anywhere in the world. Ambition, married with a healthy dose of realism and practicality and resources will be needed to actually achieve the high targets we set ourselves. The Energy Performance of Buildings Directive is the main EU level legal instrument for decarbonizing member states' building stock. Since the adoption, the EPBD has been closely connected with the EU climate targets and has been aligned to reflect their progressive evolution. There are numerous potential environmental, social and economic benefits associated with energy efficiency renovation, leading to energy savings, lower emissions, reduced energy bills for households and job creation, as well as improving European competitiveness and economic resilience. However, this transformation is no easy task and it will not come about without sufficient incentives and the correct regulatory framework. About 85 to 95 percent of today's buildings will be in use by 2050, showing the dire need to upgrade the energy efficiency of existing buildings. We cannot just concern ourselves with new builds. Where are we right now in regards to this? Well, the answer is not where we need to be. The building renovation rate is currently around 1% per year, which is admittedly very, very low. And this reality needs to start increasing more progressively quickly. The building renovation rate is impeded by the fact that the largest potential gains are in the residential sector, where landlords are more scattered than in the non-residential space. Further increases in this area will be certainly needed. Staged and deep renovation of the existing building stock will be crucial to realize the energy efficiency potential of buildings. Member states need to recognize this, but unfortunately, it is very clear that not all have embraced the potential of the renovation wave. The submitted long-term renovation strategies have in general broadly respected the requirements of the EPBD. However, the level of detail provided and ambition varies considerably from one member state to another. Although we have seen improvements, there is a significant unexploited energy efficiency potential in buildings renovation. This is notably due to the suboptimal 
transposition, lack of adequate funding, and other barriers. The revised EPBD needs to tackle these issues as much as possible in synergy with other legislation such as the RED2 and EED. The renovation wave must make best use of technological and digital developments to monitor and improve energy efficiency of existing buildings. A more efficient, technically equipped and smarter building stock should be the cornerstone of a decarbonized energy system. The revision of the EPBD should serve to further promote smart building technologies and foster a data center approach. In this regard, it would be pivotal to create a framework to leverage the use of data to improve transparency, develop benchmarks and guide policy decisions, as well as improve actual energy consumption. Buildings need to also be recognized as a contributor to the flexibility of the energy system through energy production, storage and demand response, as well as green charging stations for electric vehicles. Ever since 2018, our ability to utilize data has dramatically improved. The revised EPBD needs to ensure comparability. In particular, not all long-term renovation strategies provide greenhouse gas emission reduction data, making it difficult to assess the ambition of the strategies in terms of climate mitigation. Carbon emissions can be reduced at every stage of the building's life cycle, especially through the use and deployment of emergent technologies such as 3D modeling and simulation and artificial intelligence. There are many interesting and important areas of this legislation and although I have only scraped the surface, I hope I have shed some light on how I see my role as Rapporteur of the Implementation Report on the EPBD. I hope you enjoy the discussions and I look forward to taking part in the conversation in the future. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Well, if you stayed with us this long, then you deserve a medal. Um, great words there from Sean, encouraging to hear so much uh, emphasis on the need for uh, better data to track the impact of our renovations. At the end of the day, that is at the heart of what Build Upon Squared is about. So we look forward to uh, continuing the discussions with uh, Sean and, and the other uh, MEPs and the other um, stakeholders in the Commission that we regularly connect with for our advocacy work. And we hope also to connect with you again soon in the future. Thank you again and have a great evening.